Our text is Psalm 139, 13 to 16. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Beloved, so far in Psalm 139, we have noticed that God is both omniscient, he knows all things, and omnipresent, he is everywhere present. But we have been taught by this psalm not to view those two perfections of God abstractly. David, who wrote this psalm, is not content to say God knows everything, but he knows me. And David is not content to say God is everywhere present, but rather he is always with me. In other words, the emphasis of this psalm is personal. We also have taken note so far of the fact that David applies these truths of God's perfections and uses them as a reason for worship and for his own personal comfort and assurance. And that's how doctrine, beloved, becomes practical. Take the truth of God and apply it to your own life in such a way that you find material to praise God and that you find even more reason to have your faith strengthened in this God and so that you are more assured and comforted by the truth which is given in the scriptures. Remember, the truth of the scriptures is given to us for our consolation, not for the wicked, to terror to the wicked, that God would be omnipresent, that God would be omniscient, but for the child of God, it is a comfort for his soul. That's because the knowledge with which Jehovah knows David is the knowledge of love, the knowledge of fellowship, knowledge in the covenant of grace. And the presence that Jehovah has with David is such that nothing will be able to separate David from the loving, merciful presence of his good God and Father. And now David moves on to another attribute of God, from God's knowledge and God's omnipresence to God's power. We might say God's omnipotence. We have those three omnis. Omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere present, omnipotent, all-powerful. And again, David does not look at the power of God abstractly and doesn't say, well, God is so powerful that he can smash the rocks into pieces and the mountains melt before his presence, as he says in other parts of the Bible. But rather, he says, Jehovah's power is seen in this, in his careful, loving, merciful forming of life. And especially in his careful forming of David's life. Jehovah's hand, that's the figure used in the psalm. 
Jehovah's hand as carefully, as carefully as does an embroiderer, formed David in the womb of his mother. And that's what he goes on to describe in our text this morning. That too, says David, is a marvelous and an awesome work of God. It might not appear on the surface to be as exciting as an eruption of a volcano or an earthquake, let's say, but this is a marvelous work of God that God performs in secret and a work of God at which David can then say, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that ought to be our response to that work of God as well. When we consider the work of God at forming a little baby in the mother's womb, and even as we think about God's forming of us in our mother's wombs, we ought to think, what a marvelous work of God that is. What a testimony to the power of God that is. What a testimony to God's love and attention to me that is. And surely, if God has carefully formed us in our mother's wombs, then, and that's the connection to the preceding context, then surely God must know us. If God has formed us, if God has even planned us down to the smallest detail, as David describes in this psalm, surely God must now know us. The God who is with me knows me. That's the connection of omnipresence to God's omniscience. And the God now who formed me in my mother's womb, he knows me too. That's the connection between omnipotence and God's omniscience. Let's then consider this passage of scripture under the theme, Jehovah's forming of me. Jehovah's forming of me. Notice first the meaning, and then the mystery, and finally the marvel. The main idea of our text, beloved, is Jehovah's forming of David, and therefore Jehovah's forming of us in the womb. We must therefore understand that Jehovah's knowledge of us, and indeed his care for us, does not begin when we are born. It does not even begin when we are converted, perhaps later on in our life. It begins when we are conceived. That's when we begin to exist as persons. Indeed, Jehovah's knowledge of us and Jehovah's care and love for us in the covenant of grace begins, if one might speak of such a thing, in eternity. God has always known us in his eternal decree. And so David now, meditating upon the great works of God, marvels at this great work of God, the forming of a child in the womb of the mother. There is, beloved, no more delicate, vulnerable person than a tiny, unborn child in its mother's womb. David begins in verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins. Reins there are literally kidneys. And from that word we get our word renal, pertaining to the kidneys. The kidneys are not only the organs which filter the impurities out of our blood, that was not known to David in his day, the real meaning of kidneys. But they are incredibly delicate organs. They are well protected by our body, but a kick in the area around the kidneys is extremely painful. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why the ancients, the Hebrews and others, saw the kidneys 
as the seat of tender emotions. The kidneys, therefore, are in that respect like the bowels, which are also the seat of tender emotions. In addition, the reins or the kidneys are in Scripture connected with the heart in that phrase to search the heart and the reins. The idea is God, who is the omniscient judge, searches the heart and the reins of man. He is therefore privy in his infinite knowledge to their secret thoughts, their secret intelligences, their deepest emotions and feelings. That's the idea of that phrase in the Bible, the God who searches the hearts and the reins. For example, Psalm 7 verse 9, the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Jeremiah 11 verse 20, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that trieth the reins and the heart. And Revelation 2 23, all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. And notice, by the way, that third reference is a reference to Jesus Christ himself. The exalted and ascended Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can say about himself, I am the one who searches the hearts and the reins, which proves that he is God. He is omniscient. And David says here, Jehovah Thou hast possessed my reins, which means that thou hast formed them, and that thou hast taken ownership of them. My innermost thoughts and the most tender emotions of my heart belong to thee, my God. Thou dost know them perfectly. Now besides the reins, David speaks of his substance in verse 15, and again in verse 16, he uses that expression, my substance yet being unperfect. Now, those two words for substance are not the same in the Hebrew. The substance of verse 15 is often translated bones and refers to that part of man which is hard and physical. You might say his physical frame. They are that part of man which is strong and substantial. And David is speaking about his substance while he was still in the womb. While he was still a tiny, fragile, not fully formed human being. While there was in him only the beginning of a fully formed skeleton which would become his final substance. But David says that tiny substance as it was developing under thy careful care, O God, was not hidden from thy eyes. The other phrase which is rendered in our Bible substance yet being unperfect is actually in the Hebrew one word which we might translate today as embryo embryo. The word has the idea of something wrapped up or folded together, something formless or not yet shaped. So the idea that Dave was expressing here is that he was a human being in his mother's womb who, although he had been carefully designed and planned by God, was not yet fully formed. And that little embryo, at times the size of a grain of rice or of a peanut, was David. That was David. That was the person David. That was David in the very beginning of his development as a human being. And says David, when I was only, you might say, a substance, God saw me. God observed me. God knew me and God loved me. 
And all of this, beloved, is very striking, important to notice, especially in our modern culture, that this David, although a tiny and as yet unformed substance, his reins, his substance, his little skeleton, his embryo, was David himself. And that David, as an unborn child, was the object of Jehovah's knowledge, care, and love. And so Psalm 139 is powerful testimony to us, beloved, that, the, that an unborn child is a real, valuable human being with a right to live before God. No one has the right, therefore, to destroy the life of an unborn child. David may have been unformed. David, however, was a distinct person. He was not the same person as his mother. He was distinct from his mother. He was growing in the womb of his mother. He was developing there. And notice the language that David uses is personal. My reigns. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb, my substance, my substance yet being unperfect. We must emphasize that, beloved, because we live in a culture of abortion. One of the most horrendous crimes of which modern man is guilty. In America, abortion is legal in many states up to the very moment of birth. In fact, in some parts of America, you may partially deliver the child in the delivery room and then kill the child as long as it is not fully delivered. You may say that child has not yet got the right to live. And that's what the American Supreme Court has allowed. In Britain, just across the water from us, it is legal to kill an unborn child up to 24 weeks of pregnancy and Ireland has just passed a law, a very controversial law, which allows abortion in Ireland now in very limited circumstances but interestingly and alarmingly that law does not have any term limits. In other words there's nothing in the law that says you can only abort up to 24 weeks or 12 weeks or ever, there are other qualifications required for an abortion in Ireland, but it's nothing to do with how long the baby has been in the womb. And for many years, and still today, Irish women cross the Irish Sea and go to the UK where they can have an abortion under that jurisdiction. That's a monstrous crime, I say, because it is the murder of a real human being. You can't say that that child in the womb is not a real human being. And that's why the church must continue to condemn the awful crime of abortion. And let us not be mistaken or fooled by the propaganda either, the vast majority of abortions take place all around the world, not because of those so-called exceptions of rape and incest and the life of the mother. That's a very small percentage of the reason for having an abortion. Most children are aborted in the Western world because that child is deemed to be an inconvenience to the parents who ought to have thought before they slept together to produce that child. And abortionists will try to dehumanize and depersonalize the child in the womb. They don't like to speak of the child in the womb as a child or a baby unless of course that child is desired by the parents and then it's a baby or a child 
at all as well. But if the child is not desired, that child will be depersonalized and called a fetus or an embryo or a blob of cells or some unwanted tissue or an appendage to the woman's body. All in order to justify the killing of a child. But David, beloved, was a person. From his conception, from the very moment of his conception, in his mother's womb. And David was developing as a person in the womb of his mother for some nine months of her pregnancy. And while he was thus developing, David confesses, God's eye saw him. And God's eye was carefully watching him. He was under the care of Jehovah, his God. And if David's mother had lived in the modern age and had the medical means of going to a planned parenthood clinic, let's say, and availing herself of an abortion, she would have been guilty not of removing some cells from her body which were unwanted to her, she would have been guilty of murdering David. David, before he saw the light of day. And nothing can justify such a monstrous crime. We see in this text how Jehovah's forming of David and of us is connected to his knowledge of David and of us and to his presence with David and with us. That transition is seen in verse 13 by the word for or because. David in the context has just exclaimed that Jehovah is always with him, that Jehovah so surrounds David by his presence that David can never escape from Jehovah's constant care, his spirit, his presence, or his face, and his hand. And this includes the darkness. Even the darkness will not hide me from Jehovah, says David in verse 12. And then David's thoughts, you might think, go to the darkest and most mysterious place that he can imagine, and that's the womb of his mother. This is 3,000 years ago when David writes these words. No one in David's day could peek inside the womb of a pregnant woman and see what was going on in that mysterious place. But Jehovah can, and Jehovah does. And says David, concluding this, if Jehovah took such care in forming me, in forming my substance, my substance yet being on perfect, my reins, will that care not continue into my life while I am living in the world surrounded by dangers? And if Jehovah has so carefully and meticulously designed me down to my reins, an unformed substance, does he not know that I am born into the world, not completely and intimately know me, even down to the innermost recesses of my heart and mind? That's the argument that David's making in this psalm. And this, beloved, is true with respect to all covenant children. David is not a child of the wicked. David is a covenant child born to godly parents. And God's care and love for covenant children does not begin when they are born. It does not begin when we bring them for baptism after they are born. It does not begin when they grow up and make confession of their faith in the church. Jehovah is our God from the very beginning of our existence. Indeed, Jehovah is our God from eternity. And Jehovah has said, I will be your God and the God of your seed after you in your generations 
for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to your seed after you. And therefore, Jehovah is intensely interested, beloved, in the pregnant women in the church. He is interested in the development of the children of the church in the womb. He delights in every stage of growth as he himself, as with his own hand, forms those little children of the covenant in the womb of their mothers for himself. And Jehovah loves our children too. He has chosen them in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. He has redeemed them in the blood of his Son. He has engrafted them into Christ, and he even regenerates them ordinarily by the Spirit of Christ from the womb. Now I am talking about the children of believers, not the children of the wicked. They're not even in view in this psalm. And I'm talking about the elect children of believers. This, for example, was not true of Esau. God did not love him from the womb. In fact, God hated him from the womb. We read in Romans 9, verse 13. And now David, as a grown man, looking back in his mind's eye to what happened to him when he was in his mother's womb, thinking about all of those things that Jehovah was doing for him before he was born, he now, as a grown man, surveys the completed process and says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is our confession too, by the grace of God this morning. I am made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Our confession is not that of unbelief of a man like Richard Dawkins, the atheist. I am a wonder of evolution. I'm not. I am a wonder of natural selection. I am a wonder of nature. No. Our confession is this. I am a creation of God. He formed me. He designed me. He made me. I am his. I belong to him. I exist, therefore, in the world to praise him. And you don't need to know much about biology or anatomy to understand this. It's blindness and folly of unbelief to deny our creation by a personal, wise, and powerful God. And having formed us with such care, beloved, God knows us. He knows us in a way in which a computer designer might know every circuit and component of a machine which he has personally designed and built. And yet that's too impersonal an example. He knows us with the perfect knowledge of love. And so when you look at yourself, beloved, you must see that. You must see yourself as the work of a master craftsman who has an eye for detail. But the more you learn about biology, the more you learn about how the human body even works and is designed, you will be filled with amazement at the work of God. You should be and you must be. Jehovah then knows. He knows and sees, because he has created, every blood cell which is now flowing through your bloodstream. He knows and sees every contraction of your heart muscle. He knows every chemical reaction in your digestive tract. He knows all of those electrical impulses in your brain. He knows things about your body which he has formed for himself that you do not know and that no scientist as yet has discovered and which man will never be able to know. And he also knows, having brought you into a fallen world, he knows about the diseases and problems of your body as well. He knows where there is arthritis forming in your joints. 
He knows where there might be a blood clot. He knows where a tumor is forming. He knows things which no doctor's probe will be able to discover. And you must not fear and wonder, I must go to a doctor and have myself checked out after this morning's sermon. You must not fear and think that because God has planned all of those things for your good because he is our Father who loves and cares for us. We can sum it all up in one word. David uses that one word, wonderful, wonderful. That phrase, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that phrase, wonderfully made, is really in the Hebrew just one verb form, which is rather difficult to translate smoothly. I have been miracled. I am the object of a miracle. I have been wrought by means of a miracle. I have been set apart and distinguished in an extraordinary way. That's the best I can come up with for a translation of that Hebrew verb. And so in this sample of it, David describes in a beautifully poetical and picturesque manner the forming of a child in the womb. And it gives us some insights into that wonderful work of God, which I remind you, David describes 3,000 years ago, long before any of the modern knowledge that medicine has given us today. He uses different verbs to describe his work in the womb of pregnant mothers. Verse 13 says cover. Verse 15 speaks about making in secret. And verse 15 also says curiously wrought. To cover there has a twofold idea. First, to cover with respect to shielding or protecting. And second, to cover with respect to covering over with network or to knit together. David here confesses that when he was at his tiniest and most vulnerable, that is, in his mother's womb, Jehovah, his God, cared for him and loved him. And therefore, we must have that same confidence in Jehovah, our God, this morning, that he cares for us even when we are tiny and vulnerable. That word is used also in Psalm 91. We, we sang that earlier. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. In Psalm 71, we also uh, sang that. For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. The word could also be translated as overshadow. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, of course, that was a unique forming of a human being in the womb of a unique person by a miracle. But that's also the way in which we are formed in our mother's wombs by means of a miracle, something marvelous, something astounding, something that we cannot comprehend. And then verse 15 speaks about curiously wrought and cover can also mean to knit together. Think of tapestry or embroidery. Tapestry or embroidery is a delicate and careful and exact work of knitting together many threads of different textures and colors to make a beautiful pattern. And here, Jehovah 
informing David in his mother's womb is making a tapestry of bones and muscles and sinews and tendons and ligaments and organs and tissues and various other components of our humanity to form them together in such a way that after nine months of pregnancy that baby is fully formed and ready to come forth from the mother's womb according to the purpose of God. And yet, all of this is intensely mysterious. With modern science, we have more understanding and knowledge of the development of a child in the womb than we ever did before. And yet, for all that, it still remains very, very mysterious. And all we've done, really, is give man even less excuse for the monstrous crime of abortion. Because the more we know about what goes on in the mother's womb, the more we see the development of a child from the moment of conception all the way to birth, the more we understand that that child is always a human being, a distinct person from the mother. Scientists now know, for example, that as soon as an egg is fertilized by the sperm, the zygote, as it is called, is genetically distinct from the mother. Scientists know that. David did not have knowledge of that. And therefore, it is nothing but ignorance and wicked propaganda to say that a baby is an abnormal growth, a piece of tissue or an appendage to the mother's body. That's ignorance and propaganda used to promote the idea of abortion. When David's unformed, imperfect substance was developing in the womb of his mother, there were two persons, not simply one person. There was not one person and one potential person. There was not one person and one parasite. There was not one person and one disease, but there were two persons. The mother is a person and the child is a distinct person. And even the law, as topsy-turvy as the law often is, recognizes this. If a man murders a pregnant woman, in many jurisdictions, he is guilty of two homicides. Two. How in the world could you be guilty of two homicides if you've killed a woman and a blob of tissue? No. The law, even as topsy-turvy and as inconsistent as it is, recognizes that that child is also a second person and therefore ought not to be killed. Except, of course, when it becomes an inconvenience and there are all kinds of ways of getting rid of that child. Many websites will give you lots of information about the stages of development of the unborn child. Here are a few details I discovered this week. Remember, David did not know these things, but the Spirit revealed to him what we have in Psalm 139, which is enough for us to have no excuse for not recognizing that the child is a distinct person from the mother. By the first month of pregnancy, a baby, which is the size of a grain of rice, has a heartbeat which can be detected by a doctor. By two months of pregnancy, a baby has fingers and toes. By three months of pregnancy, a baby has unique fingerprints. By four months, the baby can suck his thumb, curl his fingers and toes, and has hair, eyebrows, and eyelashes. By five months, the baby has well-developed senses of taste, smell, hearing, sight, and touch. And by six months, the baby is so well-formed, 
He could survive outside the womb in most cases, and by seven months, the baby can open and close its eyes. But remember, in many jurisdictions, abortion, the killing of such a baby at various stages of its development, is permitted up to 24 weeks. And God, who oversees the entire process of the development of the child in the womb, will certainly avenge the blood of all of those children. What judgment is coming upon this wicked world? David describes this mystery not only in terms of embroidery, but in terms of secrecy. Verse 15, when I was made in secret. That word does not only mean concealed, hidden from outside view, it also means a hiding place or a safe refuge. What could be more secret, beloved, than the womb of a pregnant mother? And what ought to be safer than the womb of a pregnant mother? Even today, with all of our modern technology, it is very difficult for a doctor to see exactly what is going on inside that mysterious place. Perhaps you've seen pictures of ultrasounds in the womb. What you can see is a kind of a shadowy form with some vague features or some more distinct features, perhaps. And even the best doctors can misread such an ultrasound and misdiagnose what might be happening in the womb. There are all kinds of stories, beloved, of doctors telling parents this child has this particular disease. This child will not survive very long outside the womb. We advise you to abort this child. And then the child is born. And the child has no defect whatsoever, or perhaps only a very slight defect, which can be very easily repaired by simple surgery. So there is no excuse for killing such a child. God is working away in secret in the womb of mothers, doing his careful work as with his embroider's needle, forming us in such a way that no man can see and no man-made probe can penetrate. So David, speaking poetically now, and not literally, says that I was curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And obviously, he wasn't wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. David knew he was wrought in the womb of his mother. He's speaking here as a poet, because remember, the Psalms are poetry. But the idea there is of a secret remote, difficult to reach place, a dark and mysterious place, the lowest parts of the earth. And Job, also speaking poetically, in Job 10 says, Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. But the point is, where man could not see, and where man's probe cannot go, God sees. Thou hast covered me, says David, my substance was not hid from me, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and as Calvin says in a quote in the bulletin, this is marvelous. Imagine doing such a difficult and intricate work in the dark. But God does all of this in the dark. 
And then there is the mystery of God's purpose. David also recognizes this in the psalm. God has, and here's a phrase often misused, a wonderful plan for the life of David as he carefully embroiders him in a mysterious tapestry in his mother's womb. David speaks about God's book. All my members were written in God's book. And by members here, he means days. Days. Literally, verse 16 says, And in thy book all of them have been written, days have been formed, and not one of them. All the days, therefore, of, Jehovah, of David's life were carefully planned by Jehovah God. Before David takes his first breath outside the womb of his mother. That includes all of the experiences of David's life, the number of his days, the kind of days they are, the good things and the bad things, everything planned in detail by Jehovah God who loves and cares for his people. And this careful planning also includes those things which we might in our foolishness call Mistakes, miscarriages, fetal abnormalities, defects in the baby of a physical or psychological nature. Those things too are carefully planned by Jehovah God. We call some of those people, and there are outstanding members of the Protestant Reformed Churches in America, who fall into this category, the most beautiful people you would ever meet. We call them special children or special needs children. They have physical disabilities. They have mental disabilities. They have problems because of a genetic mistake in their code, we would say today, in our scientific age. But they are not mistakes. They too were formed by Jehovah in the womb. He determined the exact physical and psychological characteristics of those children as well. They too are fearfully and wonderfully made. They too, when God gives them to us, must be received as gifts of God, loved and cherished as members of the church. And abortion is a horrible crime against them too. And actually, they are among the worst victims of abortion. The doctor says to the parents, you know, this child is going to have Down syndrome in the vast majority of cases, the parents opt to abort or to kill that child. And this, and here's the irony of course, this in an era of anti-discrimination. Let's not discriminate against handicapped people except kill them before they are born. What folly, what madness, what wickedness is this? Now all of this must lead us to praise God. That's the point of Psalm 139. Theology must lead to doxology. A right understanding of God and his works must lead us to a heartfelt praise of God for his greatness and goodness. And this is exactly the effect that all of this has upon David. I will praise thee, he says. David takes this time to worship Jehovah, his maker. David says, Jehovah has done wondrously in making me. He has done wondrously, beloved, this morning in making us. We can say, therefore, I am a marvel. 
not to praise myself, but how great I am, but to praise God who made me. And that's the folly, too, of the unbeliever. The unbeliever might be impressed sometimes as he looks at how complex and detailed the human body is. He might even get a shiver of wonder in his spine as he sees the birth of a child. But he does not praise God. He praises himself. He praises medical science. He praises the achievements of man. But David says, I will praise thee, I will praise my God, and I will fear. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, which means not that I am terrified of the fact that I have been made, but rather I find it awe-inspiring. As I think about what Jehovah has done in making me in the way in which he has made me, I am awestruck and I tremble with a kind of a holy reverence before God and my Father. This is a fear rooted not in terror, but in love. And that fear will show itself practically, you want practical preaching? Practically in obedience to God's commandments. And so we must echo what David echoes in this psalm. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. But more marvelous than that, beloved, than God forming us in the womb, more marvelous than that is that God who formed us in the womb loves us and saves us. Remember, that although we are tiny and imperfectly formed in our mother's wombs, we are even as tiny babies guilty of Adam's sin and shapen in iniquity. As David confesses elsewhere, in sin did my mother conceive me. That's the error in many Christians. They are taken aback by the cuteness of babies, and they assume, therefore, that babies must be innocent in their mother's wombs. Yes, it's true, they're innocent before the law of the state, and therefore not worthy of death by the state, but, Christ but children are not automatically entitled because of their smallness and youth to salvation. That would be a mistake. And Jehovah here lovingly formed David in his mother's womb with a view to saving him from his sins, with a view to adopting him and bringing him into his gracious covenant. That's true for us, and that's true for our elect children as well. And that's the assurance we have when God in his good providence takes children from us in their infancy. But that required an even greater miracle. That required an even more marvelous work in the womb of another woman. That required the birth of an even more extraordinary child. Even more marvelous is God's work of salvation. More marvelous is that the Son of God becomes a man. And not a grown man right at the beginning, but that the Son of God becomes a tiny, little, unformed substance in the womb of Mary. And then that, that little, unformed substance, who was Jesus, the person of the Son of God in our human nature, develops as we do for nine months in the womb of Mary and then is born into the world as an ordinary baby. And even more marvelous is that that little baby grows up to be a man who died upon the cross to pay for all of our sins and to rise again for our salvation. And thus we must Trust 
and love the God who not only formed us, but saved us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy great work of forming us and thy great work of preserving us in this world, even to the present day. We trust thee, and we pray thou will give us an even greater trust of thee as we continue to study thy word and live before thy face. For Christ's sake, amen.